Great, um, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I'm super excited to be here in Malaga. It's been a really fun uh, couple of days. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about, or I'm gonna talk to you about uh, distributed sagas, and this is a protocol that I've been working on for coordinating microservices and making them more understandable. Um, so I'm Katie McCaffrey. I'm a distributed systems engineer at Twitter. Uh, this is where you can find me on the internet. Um, I'm at Katie, it's pretty simple. Uh, also, if you have questions or wanna reach out to me after the talk, my DMs are open. It's actually an easier way to get in touch with me than email, so just use that. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Okay, um, so basically, once upon a time, we used to construct these monolithic applications and they ran um, at scales that could safely fit inside a single relational database. And this was actually really nice from sort of an abstraction point of view because all of the complex logic about consistencies um, and con uh, con uh, different m consistency models and like concurrency control was sort of all handled by this single database. And it like was our nice abstraction that dealt with all the difficult stuff. Um, and you would just like horizontally scale out your application. And that was really nice. Uh, but then we're, we are now in a time where we can no longer fit on a single database and the availability of a single database is no longer sufficient um, for our customers and for our applications. And so, you know, in the mid 2000s, we start seeing this rise uh, of, of microservices and NoSQL, and basically what, we, what is the uh, driving force behind these, uh, these patterns and the NoSQL databases is basically we want availability and we want to be able to scale beyond a single machine. Um, and so these are really nice things because with microservice architectures, um, we get a lot of benefits, like you can have different teams independently de uh, develop and deploy services um, at faster duration speeds, they own their own deployment and things like that, so we can be more agile. Um, and then with these NoSQL databases, we basically uh, have to denormalize all of our data in our different services, um, but we get higher availability, but weaker consistency models. Um, and so basically what happens here is we've traded off of a lot of the strong consistency and a lot of that abstraction of like this one piece of our system being like our single relational database owning all the consistency guarantees and sort of smeared it across this whole architecture. And so there's kind of a term for this and Peter Bayless wrote a paper about it called Feral Concurrency Control. Um, and this is a really great paper, I like it, because it's academia looking at what industry is actually doing and trying to um, offer some solutions or like get some insights. And, and he looks at the Ruby on Rails community and that sort of workstation, but I think it's broadly applicable to how we develop software today. So what he defines feral concurrency control basically as application level mechanisms for maintaining database integrity. So this is basically saying, hey, we used to live in this nice relational database model that dealt with everything, um, but now we have to actually write code to make sure the semantics and invariance of our applications hold throughout the, uh, the lifetime of the system. Um, and I just think this is a really cool term. Like I laughed really hard when I first read this paper. Some people got mad, but I thought it accurately described what I do day to day as a developer. So let's take an example of, of how we might start building an application um, with our microservices architecture. So we're a small startup and we wanna help people book hotels um, on the internet and be a travel application, but we'll just start with hotels. And we want our application to hold the invariant that we will confirm a reservation with the hotel and then we'll like charge someone's credit card. We will never like charge someone's credit card and then be like, sorry, we can't give you a room. So that's the invariant that product has decided we need to hold with our application. So we build a service where like on your phone, you might talk to some front end that will route you to our hotel microservice, which will deal with booking the hotel and all of the logic around that. And it will probably have its own storage. And then once it's successfully booked a hotel, it will then forward the payment information to the credit card API or whatever service you use to charge data. And so what we're actually actually doing here is there is feral concurrency control mechanism built into the service and we're enforcing the causality of our invariant by chaining the request in this manner. First I have to confirm that the hotel gets booked and then I will um, like make the payment happen and this happens uh, causally because like they're happening sequentially inside of a process. Um, but what, where this gets a little messy is that if you think through this whole scenario like what if I can't charge your credit card, right? Then Mike just went out, nope, there it's back. Okay, I have to free up the, the hotel reservation and make sure that you don't hold a hotel reservation if you don't have a valid credit card. So that's like additional feral concurrency control and failure handling that I have to build into my microservice. Okay, fine, that's not too hard, we can do that. Um, so then our service does great. We now decide we wanna expand to help people book hotels and cars and airline tickets. Uh, we get a lot more funding, so we have a bunch of, hire a bunch of people and we spin up a bunch of other teams and because we're microservices, each person can work on every, uh, we have different people working on different uh, services. So we'll create a car service that will do the same sort of thing and it will like hold the same environment where we want to make sure a car reservation exists and can be booked and then we'll charge the person's credit card. And then we'll do the same thing for a flight, right? And this is like a super standard way that we develop code. It's like very easy to see how this would evolve over time. 
But then product comes back and says, OK, we're so successful with this. We want to introduce a new feature called trips, which will allow a user to specify their location and dates, and we'll book everything for them. It's like, you know, like a travel agent service as a service. Um, and so this should be super easy, because we already have the, the functionality to book a hotel, and we already have the functionality to book a car reservation, and we already have the functionality to book an airline reservation. So product is like, yeah, this should release really fast. Like, this should be easy. So we spin up a new service, microservice, to like, embody this trips feature. And it'll have its own data store. And it'll talk to these other services to book trips for us. Um, but this thing has a ton of feral concurrency control mechanisms built into it, because we have to handle a lot more edge cases. And a lot more things can fail now, if you look at this graph. We have to handle of what if you can't book the car when you can't book the hotel and the airline reservation. Now you have to make sure that you go and like um, cancel those reservations that you've already made. Uh, we have to handle the scenario of what if this service goes down that's handling the request and I've booked the hotel and the car and the airline service. Like I have to make sure I either free them or like pick that process back up and notify you as a user. Like we don't want to leak. You can think of it as like leaking memory in a system, right? You'd leak hotel reservations and car reservations and things over time. That's obviously a horrible business, and you can't do that. Um, so like we could do this, and people do this all the time. I've definitely built systems like this. It's just tricky and difficult to get right and error prone. And it's usually like one of those things that product never understands, where they're like, you have all this stuff. Like why isn't it easy just to like combine them? And you're like, well, distributed systems. Um, so this is our resulting architecture if we look at the system as a whole of all the different calls and paths. This is super simple, and obviously there'd be like a lot more things happening in here. But I think it's pretty easy from this example to see how we end up with these Death Star architectures. Um, this term is from Adrian Cockcroft. I'm stealing it from him. But this is Netflix's, um, a, a graph of Netflix's call diagram on the, the left. Right? I'm backwards from you. Anyway, that one is Netflix, and this one is Twitter's. Um, and like, you can look at a bunch of services, and they look like this. Like, Uber also has one that's in like one of Matt Rainey's talks. He actually has this like really impressive video from Yao. But you end up with these really, really complex systems because we're having independent teams just like evolve a new architecture over time, and no one's looking at the big picture. Um, and these things become super difficult to maintain over time. Uh, they're really difficult to understand because you have all this chaining of consistency models in microservices, and it's not really documented anywhere, and like, you don't really understand it, and then like, people leave the company, or they move on and work on a different thing, and then someone has to understand this whole system and learn it new, and then you have an incident because they like, just looked at the microservice they were modifying and didn't know that like, the order of those calls was important. Um, so this gets a little... I don't know if this is coming back this time. Okay. Yep. Back? OK. Um, OK, so this is kind of nuts. And, and, and what I like to think about is, can we do better? Can we make it easier to build these distributed applications? Like, what are we missing? Because microservices are nice. And I fundamentally believe that that's like a good way to build systems and scale teams and things like that. But like, how, can we do better than feral concurrency control? How can we make it less difficult to build and maintain applications over time? So what about Spanner, right? Spanner is Google's globally distributed database. They actually just released it, I think, like totally GA yesterday. I think I saw Eric Brewer tweet about it. But it's, in, it's been in beta since earlier this year. Um, and they wrote a paper on it in 2012. But basically, Spanner is Google's scalable, multi-version, globally distributed, and synchronously replicated database. So they're basically providing asset levels, um, SQL Server-like transactions uh, in a database that is globally distributed. So you have uh, replications all across the world. Uh, the way they provide this, and if you've heard of the CAP theorem, people sort of joke that it's like beats CAP. It doesn't. It's just like it's still an, uh, a, a CP system, which means you give up availability, but they have five nines of availability. And the way they do that is via the TrueTime API, a massive amount of hardware fiber between data centers and GPS and atomic and clocks installed on every individual machine. So that's a lot. Um, but uh, and it is cool. But and, and Google really swears by this. And they say the reason they built this and invested so much in money in this is because it's just easier to think about and have people program. But then you have this other take where Facebook's like, eh, nope, like, we're not going to do that because, and they wrote a whole paper on it in 2015 about why they haven't adopted strong consistency models at scale. 
Um, and they, it, this, this is a seven-page paper. It's interesting to read, I think, as a technical report, but basically it comes down to the biggest barrier is that consistency mechanisms must integrate across many stateful services. So if you think about our microservice architectures, we've denormalized state across everywhere, right? Because like, it's not in one single place. Uh, and you know, we might optimize uh, one data layout so that this query is really fast, and we might have it optimized a different way so that a different query is really fast. And that's like not a thing we can get around. And so Facebook argues in this paper, and I actually take this belief, uh, is that really strong consistency systems are not, not the end all be all. You need it in some cases, and if you saw like Chris Michael John's talk, you talk about that a lot, um, but you don't always need it, and I think we over-optimize for it. Um, and basically, also Facebook goes and makes the argument that basically users will tolerate inconsistencies over high latency. Eh, I mean, I think it depends on like what you're working on, but like fine, say that. Um, so it's also worth noting that this, this protocol that you would have to have defined between all the systems to do distributed transactions uh, across many staple services exists in the world. It's called two-phase commit. Uh, this is an atomic commit protocol. This was made a long, long time ago. I actually had trouble finding the original paper because it's really just that fundamentally part of uh, distributed systems and computer science. Um, but basically what you do, if you go back to our example, it's aptly named because it has two phases. You have a prepare phase in a distributed system where uh, the, you'll have a coordinator. So in this example, our trip service is our coordinator. And it'll say, uh, we're going to propose, we're going to do something, like book the hotel, book the car, book the flight as part of the trip. And no one's going to do it yet. They're just going to look at this and say, can I do it? And then like hold on to the resources to do it if they can. And then they're going to say, you know, vote. They're going to say, yes, I can do this, or no, I can't. And then once everyone in the system responds, which could be a long time because you're basically gated by the slowest node in your system and that kind of sucks uh, for a latency, uh, then the coordinator is going to look at everything and say, if everyone voted yes, we'll send a commit message to all the parties involved. If someone voted no, we will say, send an abort message to um, all the parties involved. And so you'll either have it succeed or fail. And then because it's a distributed system and because of the two generals problem in asynchronous ne networks, everyone has to respond done to the coordinator before you can actually know that it has successfully committed. And now everything's like atomically visible or it like never happened. So this exists, like this is a thing, it's well known. Uh, and we don't use it in industry very often. Uh, the reason we don't is because it doesn't scale. There are N squared messages in the worst case. Um, the coordinator is a single point of failure. If that single machine goes down at any single time in that process, the whole thing is sort of like goes haywire. Um, and then you have reduced throughput because essentially you're gated by the slowest node in your cluster or involved in the transaction. And then you're also um, sort of like people, they're holding locks on things and that's like never really fast essentially. Uh, oh, I think it's also worth noting with two-phase commit, like if this was scalable, like we would see the cloud vendors providing it. Azure actually has a blog post, so Microsoft Cloud has a blog post specifically stating that they don't for scale and liveness reasons. Um, and none of the major RPC frameworks like gRPC and Finagle implement this because it doesn't scale, it has problems. Um, okay. So instead, I want to tell you guys today about a protocol I've been working on. Um, it's called Distributed Sagas. Uh, I started kicking around this idea um, in, in the Halo days. I used to work on Halo. Um, the Xbox game, and we built the Halo statistics service, and we, we were looking for something, and we started playing with this idea. Um, I've been using it currently and building it out at Twitter to help us do distributed build infrastructure. Um, and then uh, I've been chatting with Uber as well. Um, I started talking with them in the middle of last year about distributed sagas and some of the problems they were having maintaining their microservices and explain this protocol to them. Um, and Matt Rainey, one of their architects, has a, really, has a talk at Yao where he talks about how they actually are implementing this so that they can... Uh, make their microservices more reasonable um, and manageable and maintainable in the future. So let's talk about this. Sagas, um, this is, distributed sagas are inspired by this paper in 1987 called Sagas. Um, and so sagas are long-lived transactions um, in a single relational database. So this is not a distributed systems paper, this is a straight up database paper. Um, and so the problem they're trying to solve here is they would notice that there would be these bottlenecks when you would have um, uh, a long running transaction, like something that was doing financial aggregation over uh, a database for like a quarter or something. Um, and maybe you didn't need um, these locks to be held, or a lot of times back in the day, like you would have to have a user actually input things to make progress in the transaction, so you're gated by a human being, which was pretty slow. And so they were trying to find a protocol to say like, can we provide some guarantees, but not maybe acid guarantees that improve, um, improve availability and latency and things like that. 
So they come up with this pattern called a saga, which is a long lived transaction that can be written as a sequence of transactions that can be interleaved. So essentially, they're breaking a big transaction that touches many tables into a bunch of little independent ones. Uh, and then they also define, um, so basically at the end of this, uh, you basically have a sequence of all transactions in the sequence either complete successfully or compensating interactions are ran to amend a partial execution. Um, and they do the typical like uh, thing at the, at the time in the 80s when it was not fully understand how difficult some of the challenges with distributed systems were. They're like, clearly this could be distributed. Like that algorithm cannot. Um, so, so I've been playing around with this and um, we're gonna go through it today because I actually find it incredibly useful. So what is a distributed saga? It's a collection of requests. So like in our travel application, it's either book hotel, book car, book flight, or charge money and compensating requests. So it's sort of like the undo requests. Cancel car, cancel hotel, cancel flight, refund money. And these things all represent a single business level action. Um, and you're gonna combine them into one. So uh, let's walk through the differences about distributed saga requests. Uh, so the, saga requ the request in a distributed saga can abort. So I can say, hey, book me a car. And it is totally fine for that service to say I'm not doing it. Uh, and say, uh, essentially abort, right? Like in the, in the database literature, you would use abort, you would just basically say like, I'm not doing it, or fail, or whatever. Um, requests must be idempotent. So this basically means that I can um, make a request, uh, and I'll get a response, and then if I make the same request again, I should basically get the same response, and it looks like the request has only happened once. So basically, you can do it many, many times, and it looks like it has only been affected once. Um, the reason you want this in a distributed saga, and often in a distributed system, is because uh, our networks are asynchronous, so if I make a request and then I like never hear back from it, I don't know what happened. Um, I don't know if the message got there and got processed and then the response was lost. I don't know if the message literally never got there because the request literally never got off box. Um, there's a bunch of things that it could have failed, and for liveness reasons in industry, we say a timeout and say we think it failed, but we're not really sure. So what I want to be able to do uh, is to replay the request uh, and then get a response, and if it happened to get there or not, that's okay. So we'll just replay requests until um, they work. We also have the idea of compensating requests. Um, and so compensating requests have to semantically undo the effect of a request. So I, I'm saying semantically because it doesn't have to exactly put the system back in the same state that it started in before the saga or that request executed. So for instance, like if um, in the example we're using, if I charged your credit card and then refunded you money, you actually might see two line items on your bill that month. And that's okay, because it's semantically in the same state. Um, another good example of this is there are, there are just things you cannot undo, because they have side effects, like sending an email. So if one of my requests sent an email, um, you could just then send a follow-up email as a compensating request to correct the information that was needed. Um, compensating requests also cannot abort. They have to be able to execute to completion. So when I say cancel the car, it has to respond true. It can't like say, no, I'm not doing it. That's not valid. Um, compensating requests also must be indefinite because I have to be able to run them until they succeed um, in order to provide the guarantee that we talked about, or in, in order to provide the guarantee that we'll get to. Um, and then compensating requests also must be commutative. Um, and so this is another mathematical term, but basically it means like when you book a car and cancel a car, it's the same as if you canceled the car, sent that message, and then booked the car. Um, and this is the same as like addition, like one plus two equals three, and two plus one also equals three. Um, and the reason we need this, and this is also a property that uh, I think we don't talk about a lot in industry and distributed systems, but like it's probably kind of wrong in a lot of stuff because we don't think about it. Um, but because of this reason where we use timeouts and we have asynchronous networks, you might start making this request like book the car. And then it waits a long time and we're like, we think it failed, we're not really sure, so we're just gonna like move on with our lives. But we don't wanna like just abort you know, indefinitely, we wanna be able to complete this person's request at some point, so we're just gonna say book it again, and then we get a response. And then maybe later we need to cancel it, so we'll say cancel car um, and get a response. And then this is a, a, time is going down in this graph, if you haven't seen these diagrams before, so that's what's happening, time's going down. Uh, and then eventually, um, you'll get this message, this pesky like book car message will decide to like actually come to the car service and we don't want there to be like a leak where someone's holding a car reservation that they shouldn't be holding. But because um, our, our cancel car request is commutative, it doesn't matter and because the book car request is idempotent, it will look like uh, no one will hold a car reservation and so that's what we want. Okay, so just to sort of like re-summarize, requests must be idempotent and can abort, and compensating requests must be idempotent, commutative, and they cannot abort. They have to always be able to be, like you could fail and have a timeout, but they have to be able to succeed if you can talk to the service. 
So if we have all these properties with our requests, uh, we will get this guarantee that all requests either completed successfully once a distributed saga has finished running, um, or a subset of requests and the corresponding compensating requests were executed. So this is nice because it means our system is in a consistent state, is semantically equivalent, um, it's holding all the invariants that we sort of set out and defined for it. It doesn't mean that like you might hold a car reservation when no one thinks you hold a car reservation, um, or we accidentally charged your card but canceled all your reservations because there was some failure in the system. Um, so this is super nice. It does have some drawbacks. Like I said, this is not an acid level transaction. There is no atomicity or no isolation. So what this means is that um, uh, the, the, the requests in the saga are visible before the entire saga completes. So you might see that um, I hold a book hotel request and a book car request. Someone may come in and try to book the hotel, but because I got the last room on that day, um, they are rejected. That request does not succeed. And then later I might cancel that request or the saga may cancel that request and then the next person could then go and book that room. This is okay, I think this makes sense. I think we're actually already doing all these mental gymnastics anyway in the current way we build systems. Um, we don't really live in an acid world anymore. Um, and for most things, it's like, like world, the world is kind of easy. Like I tell you information, then you tell someone else, and it's not like total knowledge transfer all the time. Like things don't just like pop into being fully formed. Um, so this is like important to know because like if you're talking about finances and things like that, you have to understand that they don't like all commit at the exact same time and no one sees intermediary things. But for a lot of the stuff we do day to day, this is totally fine. Okay. And so this guarantee may appear weak at first because we're not having like acid level transactions. I'm not going to give you a guarantee like Spanner does. But instead of having, but what it, I think it's incredibly powerful, but because instead of having to hand code a bunch of custom feral concurrency control logics and handle all the edge cases in every service that you're talking to, we can simply focus on what we want our applications to do once we have this in place. Um, and so you're really sort of uh, allowing people to focus on like the application they're building instead of all the edge cases and failure modes and fault domains that could happen. So how do we go and define a distributed saga? A distributed saga can be defined as a as directed acyclic graph. Uh, and so this is super nice and one of the things that I've been working on adding and extending. Uh, and the reason you want to do this is because like, sometimes you want things to happen like causally in a system. Like I want to make sure I book everything before I do the payment. And so what this means is you have um, anything, none of the nodes in the graph can be executed before um, all of their parents have completed. So this is just sort of a way to give you a, a, a way to think about it. So like in this graph, you can book the car, the hotel, and the flight in parallel. That could happen if you want to in your system. Um, and then the payment will be executed last. Each node in the distributed saga um, graph has a name. It has to be a unique name for the graph. Uh, it has a request and enough information to make that request, like book hotel, and the same for the compensating request. Uh, and then it has a status, and so this is the only piece of mo um, state that will mutate as we're going through in this graph. Um, it also has a couple like special vertices that are the top and the bottom of the graph. I name them start and end just because it sort of like I helps uh, helps me think about it, but it's really just the top of the graph and the bottom of the graph, so we know where to start and where to end. Um, and they, these are basically the same, just their compensating requests and their normal requests are no ops. So they'll get processed the exact same way, just like they have no effect on the system. <coughs> um, okay, the other piece that we need is because we want this to be durable and persist um, across failure domains is a distributed saga log. The log needs to be highly available. This is the piece in the system that um, where you want to invest in something that does have fairly high availability, because um, it's got to be like a CP system, but it needs to have high availability because if it is not available, the sagas cannot make progress um, if they can't write to the log. Uh, and then finally, we need something to execute our code, to, to, uh, and, and I call this piece the Saga Execution Coordinator, as does the original Saga paper. Um, so this is literally just a single a process of code that's running and going to execute the requests and the compensating requests according to um, how the protocol works. Uh, it's not special. Unlike two-phase commit, this um, process doesn't even have to be the same process throughout the lifetime of the Saga. It can literally be a different process for every single node in the graph, and that is totally fine. It's not special, it's just like, you know, it's just churning, it's stateless, essentially. All the state is in the, the execution, is in the log. Okay, so how do we go through and execute this? Let's keep using our trip example. If we started a saga, we get a request that says book trip request. I know that JSON's kind of like small. I'm post all these slides are already online, and I'll share a link, but it's just to give you an idea of what happens. Um, I'd have all this information, it would come in. I, I start at the top of my start saga, uh, my trip booking uh, distributed saga. 
and I'm going to then log a start saga message to the log. And this has to happen before anything else can happen, and I'm going to store all of the data associated with the request that I might need to execute any um, future request. Typically, when you implement this, you just store everything, because then you can just like read it back later, and it's great. Um, once that successfully is durably stored, it'll acknowledge it, and then I can mark the start saga node in my graph as complete, and we'll go on. Um, just for clarity, I'm marking all the stuff in pink on the slides that are like pertaining to that node, and then they'll like change as we go on um, to make, help you follow along. So now we can execute any node in the graph that's parent is complete. So that means the car node, the hotel node, or the flight node. Um, these could actually all run in parallel too. That's totally fine. Uh, so we'll log the start hotel message to the saga log. This has to happen before we can do anything else, and we need to get an act that, that has been durably persisted. We can then make the book hotel request. I'm just using information that came from the original request to do so. This is totally fine. Uh, I will get a response that says, yep, I booked your request. And then I will log an end hotel message to the log and the information from that request that came back. Uh, I'll do the same thing for the car node. This can now be processed. I'll write a start car message to the log. Once that completes, I'll send the book car request message to the car service. Uh, it will complete, give me a response. I'll then log that in the end car message in the log and then mark that node as complete. The flight can now be, is the only node in the graph that can now be worked on, so I'll say start flight and then I'll book the request once that is successfully stored. Uh, once I get a response, I'll log the end flight message uh, with the data and now we can mark that node as complete and finally we can do our payment node. Um, so I'll send the payment request, it will respond, we'll log all the data to the log. That node is now complete, and now we're at the end saga node, which is a no-op, so it just completes. Um, usually, you don't even have to really write this message. You can construct it. You have enough information in the log without it to construct it, but it is usually for performance reasons that I log it, because then you can just query and say, like, is end saga there instead of reconstructing the whole graph. Um, and now we're done. And our guarantee holds that all the requests in the graph executed successfully. Um, what's also really nice about this, just from having used it in production scenarios, is that you now have an entire log um, of everything that happened in your system, and sort of like you can add additional messages to like um, the one I'm working on at Twitter. We add messages to the start stuff as well, just for debugging if we want to. Um, so then you can go and like easily see what happened with this, which is nice for like anyone trying to figure out what went wrong, or like even customer service agents, or like you could easily make a roll-up email of everything you have it. It's there. It's great. Um, okay, so what happens when a system fails? Um, so, like, say we've started a, the trip saga in a different iteration. We started the hotel, and we've successfully booked the hotel, and we're running things in parallel this time. So the flight request is executing, and then we are also executing the um, trying to book the car. But the car service is like, no, I can't do that because I'm not gonna. I don't have a car available on that date, so it responds. Um, and so now I need to log an abort car message to the saga log. So now we're going to start a rollback, basically, because we can't guarantee that all the requests executed success successfully. So once that is um, durably persisted to the log, we're going to start rollback recovery. Um, and so basically what this is, is I flip, it's, you can think about this as I just flip all the edges in the, in the DAG. Um, I've renamed top and bottom just for clarity here. Um, and I'm going to mark all the nodes as not completed. Uh, and then we're going to start rolling back in the opposite order, working from the bottom, in this case, to the top. So, uh, so we're going to start comp saga. This is a no-op vertex. We don't do anything. We mark it as completed. Uh, we then have to ask the saga log, hey, did anything, um, are there any entries for the payment vertex? And it says no. So we can just, we know we don't have to execute any compensating requests. That request never ran. Nothing happened. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for the car. We're going to say, hey, do you have any entries? Did, did, did we do anything here? It's going to say, like, yeah, there was a start and abort, but we also know because it aborted that that request didn't complete successfully, which means we also don't have to compensate for it, so we just mark it as completed and move on. Um, for the hotel, we'll ask for the log entries. We'll get that there was a start and an end message logged. This means that we ho currently hold a hotel reservation in, in order to... Um, maintain the saga guarantee, we now have to compensate for that or cancel the hotel reservation. So we'll send a cancel hotel request. Uh, once that succeeds, we can log the information to the log if we want or just the comp hotel message to say that we've successfully done the compensating requests. And then finally, for the flight log entries, we're in kind of a weird state here. We saw that there was a start message and there is no end message. We're not really sure what happened here. We're not sure if we logged the start message in the SEC crash and never was able to make the flight message. We're not sure if that message timed out um, or completed and we didn't get a response. 
So because our, message, our requests are idempotent, we can just force it to succeed. So we'll book the flight request. Um, we'll, book, we'll get the response. And then we'll immediately cancel it. And this is the only safe way to do this. Because if you just think about, if you just try, say like, oh, it didn't happen, like you might still hold that flight reservation because it could have gotten there. That message could have gotten there eventually. Um, and basically, there is no um, safe amount of time that you could wait where that couldn't happen. Um, and because our things are commutative, this is totally fine. Um, so then now we have canceled the flight reservation and we can complete that node. Uh, we now need to log the end saga message, which is once again just an optimization, but now we're done again. And we've just walked backward and sort of undid everything we did. And we've still maintained our guarantee that no one holds a car, a hotel, or a flight reservation because the saga failed. Um, so I think this is pretty powerful because I spent a lot of time sometimes, or had been spending a lot of time ad hoc coding this, this stuff one off. Um, there's also another piece of this that I'm not going to talk about today just for time reasons. Um, it's recovering from Saga execution coordinator failure, or if you want to um, have a different process run it every time, depending on the architecture of your system, depends on how you want to do that. Um, but this is like, right, it's not special. It can fail. You can continue to make progress even if it does fail or the SEC um, changes. And this is possible because all of the data that, like all that state, any of that state that we changed in the DAG, whether it was done or not, is um, maintained in the distributed saga log and can be reconstructed from that. Um, so you can either rebuild it on literally every request, or you can maintain it in state for performance reasons and try to use the same process and then recover on failure. Um, so you can sort of, if you walk through the examples backward, I hope that's obvious that you can do that. Um, OK. <laughs> Um, so let's look, go back and look at how we start writing our travel application using distributed sagas. Uh, it would look sort of something like this if we went through the same pattern where, hey, we just want to start booking hotels. So instead of encoding our invariant that we want the credit card to get charged, charged inside the hotel service via that chaining of microservice calls, we're going to do it in a saga instead. And so we'll have a hotel, the book hotel, and then we'll just say, you know, then once that completes, book the payment and then be done. And so um, instead of like, We'll have an extra service to start, which is our SEC or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that'll handle making the requests and then rolling them back if they fail. When we add a car, it's just as simple. The car rental service, it'll be just as simple. We'll encode that dependency in the system in a saga. So you can think of sagas like you're going to have to store them somewhere. Like it's like a stored procedure. Um, or you could like send it in the entire request if you want. But usually you're doing the same thing over and over. So just sort of like load it like code. Um, and then you can go from there. Um, and so then you just literally, you have another team spin up a microservice car service, or a microservice that does car rental, and then, um, and then you encode the information in the saga, and now we don't have, like, uh, we still can just reuse that payment API, because we know it already works. And the same thing for flights, right? We just have to add the new service, and then we add a saga, which should be pretty easy. And then finally, the real power comes now when we have our set of microservices to work with. Adding the trips feature is super easy. We don't actually have to write any new code. We simply define a new kind of distributed saga called like our trip saga, and we add an extra API to our front end. Uh, and then this will execute, because we already have all the services to do it. And we're just um, encoding some um, causality and dependencies in a different way. So I think distributed sagas are really powerful because you've now isolated complex code to uh, a single logical area in your system. Um, and this thing is not a single point of failure, I think is the other really important thing, like a database, where if it went down, then like you can't do anything. This thing, you just spin up a new, another machine, and then you just keep going. Um, this is really nice, because unlike our microservices thing, the complex code lives in one place. And it's hard to, like, it's a little tricky to get right, um, but not too time consuming. But then it's like in one service, versus like this, where it's like everywhere, um, which kind of sucks. Uh, I think this using distributed sagas gets us more to a modular service design, and really goes back to what the promise of microservices or service-oriented architecture was where that service is only doing the thing it's actually responsible for, which is like booking a flight. Um, in the, the, you know, sort of the normal microservices architecture, it has to know how to book a flight, and it has to have um, feral concurrency me control mechanisms to make sure that we're not you know, um, charging someone's card when we can't get the flight, or canceling, uh, canceling the reservation when we can't charge the card, and all of that kind of stuff that goes on. Um, and then finally, I think it's really um, powerful in the sense that 
You, have, you now have service composition, if you think about this, right? Like it's much easier to just compose services because they define an API and then you just sort of define the relationships you want them to have between each other. Versus this, you would probably have to add a new service and some new feral concurrency control mechanisms to get them to behave the way that you want them to. So I hope I've convinced you that distributed sagas make building and modifying microservices easier. I would also argue they make building and modifying like any actor-based models easier. You can use this easily extend this to use it there. Um, and then also I really fundamentally think that with serverless, this is a much better pattern to go with because serverless, like you still have these cases where like writing to your database could fail, whether it's like Azure Functions or like uh, Lambda, I think in AWS. Uh, and you still have to handle all of that in the code that you write in these serverless functions. Like they're still running on a server, they're still running inside of an asynchronous network. Um, if we just do this, then instead it's much easier to like have building blocks and combine them and just have some generic protocol that deals with this for us. So thank you. Um, this is me on the internet and I'll take questions now. I think I have time, right? Thank you, Katie. Uh, any questions? Excellent presentation. Very thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have just one question. You have in this uh, example that uh, the flight booking that was unclear first needs to succeed before you can cancel it. But since these two uh, commute, wouldn't it be enough to just cancel it? Um, no. So the issue here is, let me go back to this graph. It's a little weird. I totally agree. It seems like super counterintuitive. I have so many transitions. So the reason you have to do this is because if we go back and I modify this one. Um, so the problem is, is that if I don't have this, say this book, this middle book car one doesn't exist. Like I lose that one, that doesn't execute it. Books a car, and that was a scenario we're in. We don't try it again. If I just run cancel car and that message never gets there, like. There is a property that you could define, but it doesn't have like a really good math term that I've worked on. Like the other iteration of this talk that I've done in the first version, I basically just say, oh, you just run the compensating request. And if like, like can't, then the assumption there is that canceling the car, um, you A, can't use any of the information from the booking request to cancel. So you have to be able to somehow like magically just tell it to cancel something that you don't have a reservation for, which is pretty difficult when you think about it logically um, and like how you would actually encode this. Um, and then also if you send cancel car and book car never gets this, it also has to basically be the identity function on the server, which is also kind of weird and I don't know many examples of that. Um, so I've moved to this. This is also this sort of like, you know, replay and then undo is also something that I believe is used in um, some indexing protocols for databases as well, just because you want to make sure you know it happens and then you don't have to get into this wonky world of like, did it happen or did it not? You just, you know, right? It's a stronger guarantee. Any others? Um, yeah. Uh, do you know if there are um, any uh, implement like ready generic implementations of this protocol? So um, there is not one that I would recommend using. Uh, <laughs> that So like to be fair, there if you go look at my GitHub, there is one that is like a prototype. Um, and then we've built off of that at the one that's being run into Twitter. I would not like, I, if you want to look at it and like play with it, it also doesn't encode, it's just the Saga messaging part because the SEC is very, the SEC is the hardest thing to generalize, I think, because I've done this in a couple different places. Um, it's really dependent on how you execute your, your infrastructure. Um, Uber is working on this, and they may want to open source it at some point, but I think it's also tied to, the way it actually works is tied to some stuff that I don't think they have open source yet. Um, I am also playing around with writing one, like a, an example of this with maybe in Orleans, just because I think it would be fun, and I used to work on Orleans. Um, so TBD, uh, I guess. It's, it's actually not super hard to write. If you want to go look at my GitHub, it's KDM20. Um, you can see sort of what we're doing there. Uh, but then it's also like, there's a bunch of different trade-offs in how you actually implement writing to that log and what storage you're going to use because it, it depends on like if your requests are really big, like with um, our distributed build graphs or our distributed build infrastructure, we actually are running like, it doesn't have to be super fast, but it has to like run like, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of test cases and that's like that many different tasks or whatever requests in the system and so that gets a little uh, you optimize for different stuff so there's a there's a toy one i want to say a toy very strongly like please don't pick that up and put it in production <laughs> i think one more at the back no oh, there's one. excuse me 
How do we handle uh, when a service is not available? You mean like the Saga execution coordinator? Uh, recover, the recovery. Uh, yeah, how do you recover? Uh, so that's also very, uh, sort of like, depends on your architecture. If you use like one of the major cloud vendors and like, I'm pretty sure it'll just spin you up a new one if you're using any of the PaaS solutions. Like it'll just restart the process and then it can just relook at the log. So that's totally fine. Um, you can totally, um, there's a bunch of different ways. You can use timers, you can use callbacks. Um, it's sort of based on however you, what works with your infrastructure and what you are. I, I'm a big advocate of like, use what you already have that works instead of building something um, um, custom. So this, the simplest we can assume that if uh, it's not available, it's just an, an error. Uh, so the simplest way is to just have another service like heartbeat it. Like, and you probably already have this if you're using any kind of monitoring or logging, right? So like the, the, the really simple, like I have no automation in my system is like, you might have Nagios like literally ping it every five seconds. And then if it dies, you can have someone manually go restart it. Most people have something that like does something more sophisticated than that and then will like automatically reboot the machine. So like for instance, we use um, Aurora and Mesos at Twitter. And so the way we have our SEC recover is that Aurora does heart, uh, does, excuse me, does failure detection for us and we'll notice that one of our nodes died or if it kills one of them, it'll just bring up another one somewhere else in the cluster. Um, and, and a bunch of other, I think there's a bunch of other cloud solutions that do this as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. So uh, related to the same, the same question, uh, what happens if the SEC uh, fails? Uh, you mentioned that you actually store some state there. The state of like, uh, did some, some of the steps or some of the nodes complete or not? So if you have to rest restart that somehow, uh, what do you do? Like you undo the whole transaction just in case or? No, but be, so you don't have to undo the transaction when the SEC fails. Um, so because the saga, like this graph, you may use a graph in your, in your um, code as like an optimization, like to persist that state, but you don't need to. Um, all of the information to like reconstruct this graph on the fly and to think about the algorithm is actually in the log messages. Um, and so you can basically, like you can also just literally have the SEC like read from the log uh, and then, um, and then reconstruct all the states. So that's how you recover. Did that answer your question? Yes. OK. Uh, and what if uh, we don't want to allow a user to see intermediate results? Does it mean that this protocol is not applicable for this use case? Yes. So this is very much, uh, you, I don't provide any atomic guarantees at all. Um, and most things don't, honestly. The only really thing at a distributed level out there is Spanner. Um, you can use two-phase commit at low scale, like some people do it. It works OK. Um, but I would not recommend using that in any critical or hot path. Um, I would also argue that like our desire to use ACID is sort of just a desire to make our lives easier to think about when we don't, we're A, we don't have it today. Like, and so people have figured out how to get around it and build really complex applications without using it a ton because that's how microservices work. Like no one has ACID. Um, and so you might need it for things like in Twitter, we use strong consistency for like giving you a username because that would be really bad if we gave you a username and we're like, sorry, like you can't have this username. So there are things this doesn't work for, but for a lot of stuff where you're just literally trying to think about, I want this thing to happen and then this thing to happen and then this thing to happen, uh, it actually works very well and gets some of the, the, the crazy logic out of the code. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Are we out of time? Uh, we've got five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. I don't know if you were giving me the like, we're done look. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for this presentation. It was very nice. Thanks. And the weakness point is still this co coordinator. So how to provide cover failover or something like this? Yeah. So it is, it is still... I guess what I should really draw this as is that it's not really a single point of failure because literally any process in the system can do it. It is stateless. You may be preserving some state as this is running as a performance optimization, but you don't have to. Um, and so like really you are only gated by the time it takes to spin up another machine or like hot fail over to another machine. Uh, and so this is basically like this works today. This is how like we provide high availability and NoSQL databases and distributed logs is we just like have multiple of them running or we allow them to recover, right? So 
Okay, thanks. I think that's it. Thank you, awesome. Katie. Thank you. <laughs>